Well, good morning. Good morning. How's everybody today? Good. Good. Got to get my eyes to focus here for a second here. You ever had that people, my wife used to say that people would come to her, he's, he's, he's just preaching to me. Well, I can't see you out there. I can only see with my glasses on further. But <laughs> I don't know who's out there right now. Just got back from a nice little vacation my wife and I took. Went to Boco Chico. Did I say why? Anybody know what Boco Chico is? Boca Chico. I, did I say it right? Boca Chica. Boca Chica. Anyway, wonderful place. About from here, man, maybe a little bit past the back of the stage there is the beach. And the water is right there. And if you go 30 feet this way, you're in Mexico. No borders, no border patrol. I didn't take a chance, put it that way. Right there. Anybody know what it's famous for? It's SpaceX. Man, you can walk up there and walk underneath one of the rockets they're building that's fixing to be shot up. I don't care, whoever it is, come on out there. Anyway, we had a wonderful time doing that. Got over this variance of COVID. I didn't know it was that, that was anything like that. I thought I had a cold. And um, interesting, I've discovered that when it hits, it hits two people at the same time. Because Rhonda had it too. And interesting, the more she talked, the more I coughed. I didn't understand that. <laughs> really. So anyway, right now, this month coming up, Ron and I will be here six years. It's amazing. And when I came in here, Chuck came to me and said, would you be interested in teaching a class? Uh, I think we're the baby boomer class. We're not the golden oaks. We still got some boom in us. Okay. <laughs> and so we, we teach that class there. And when I started teaching, I started teaching on the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is one of my most it's famous. It's a great book. It has a lot to do with church stuff and in it. Well, about a couple of months after I got started doing that, I got promoted, got a great job, became the director of transportation at Judson ISD. And as I began to move on that, that first eight months was like, God, you, you must have made a mistake because this is way over my head. It was a lot of stress, a lot of stuff going on. But teaching Nehemiah, I discovered the great principles from Nehemiah was meeting the needs that I had to have as far as being the director of transportation. I learned a long time ago, when you're going through stuff, get, get into the word. The promises and principles will always work if you get into the word. And I began to see these things coming out of Nehemiah that was things I was living and I was able to teach it in my class. So we finished that class about a year or so that we taught Nehemiah. Then we went into spiritual warfare. The Bible says, Paul says, we don't, we're not, this is not all about just flesh and blood. There's things, out, demonic activity, things out there. And we went about a year and a half on spiritual warfare. And then the next thing we did about a year or so was on the Holy Spirit. Learning to listen to the Holy Spirit. What, he, what is he doing in our lives? And Jen, last year, or no, just before COVID, I taught a 15-week or 19-week study on when God brings a new thing. And I spoke that on New Year's Day just before COVID. And a new thing that certainly did happen, didn't it? So I won't do part two on new things, okay? We don't need any more of that, right? The point I'm trying to get is that so much of what I teach comes from what I live, what I'm dealing with every single day. So I know they work. I know that they, they, it's something that's going to happen. So just before Thanksgiving, Chuck comes to me and says, can you preach the first Sunday in the new year? Sure, I'd love to. Right after he preached, he comes back there and he goes, by the way, if you want to make it a challenge, it'll be all right. Well, guess who gets the challenge first? Right? So I'm going to preach a word as a challenge. I've already got it. Right? So now I'm going to give it to you. So last week, or just on our meeting where we had for, uh, uh, 
for Christmas Eve meeting, he comes to me and he says, I'm really excited about what you're going to speak on and what you're going to say. And I said, so am I. I'm never quite sure what I'm going to say because I really want the Holy Spirit to take charge. And there's been times I've seen God, here it is all written out, and I didn't say anything that was on there. But God has a way of doing things. So right now, to kind of go back to where I am as far as things that happen at work, things that I'm living through, how I try, how it so much works with us today. About four years ago, three years ago, HEB is a, is a tremendous sponsor of education. And they select districts for different programs. And a particular program they came to Judson was, was teaching leadership. HEB made the statement, the, the people that have brought this to us, that the reason for the success of HEB, HEB is, the, is, the, is the emphasis on leadership, building leaders. And this program they brought to our district was like, is like a five-year thing. And it starts off with our top administrators. They sent our superintendent and another person to China to go to a major corporation to learn about different leadership. And then they would teach the upper group. Then they know the next group. And it falls to the principals, to the teachers. And the end result is if we can start bringing these principals, principals to our students, we could raise leaders right out of the education system. Pretty cool, huh? And I thought about that, and of course we're involved in this quite a bit. Leadership is something that's always been one of my things. I like to read biographies, I study on it, all those kind of things. But two things I noticed. Number one, whether you're in John Maxwell, whether you're in HEB, they all have different ways of presenting it, their plan, all the things they do. But they teach basically the same thing. I have a gentleman that he's my supervisor. He's 20 years in the Marines. So he's always talking about principles or leadership skills out of, out of the Marines. And I'm thinking what HEB is saying, you're saying the same thing, maybe in a different language, but you say the exact same thing. Then I looked about it and saw it. Do you know that the Bible is full of leadership skills? In fact, if you could, if you just said the Bible is just another book, you could take the Bible and make it a leadership manual. Isn't that pretty cool? So I got to thinking about that. It was HEB is saying this is what makes us successful. If the military is so important about building leaders, why isn't the church making more emphasis on building leaders in, our, in the church. Wouldn't leadership principles from the Bible that we had be more effective if we go out and say, this is what we've learned from God's word? Wouldn't that be a wonderful testimony among Christians to have those, those kind of things in our lives? Think about this for a minute. So we're going to talk about biblical leadership skills. Now, I could take what I have right here, and I text, uh, te- uh, text Chuck that the sermon would be about two hours long. I could really make this about a 20-week, just what I have right here, study. So I went ahead and got told Worthy to bring pizza. We'll have 15-minute breaks between every hour. Just kidding, okay? We're not going to have pizza, okay? <laughs> All right. So, but... However God leads this morning, I want to share this with you, and one particular that I'm really going to share. But just to give you an example of all of them, leaders build leaders. What's the first thing Jesus did? If he was just coming into the world, he was building a different organization. He called it the church. He titled the people in it to be Christians. His group that he was going to build were called, what, disciples? And what did he do? He spent three years building 12 guys to take over what he was going to do. That's basic one-on-one leadership. You build leadership within leaderships. Uh, Here's another one. Leaders are great followers. What did Jesus say to them? Come, follow me. 
Now, you know, there's some things about follow, being followers. Number one, you have to be a good listener. Think about what Jesus did. If you were to study, he was constantly teaching them, bringing examples to them, speaking in parables, getting them to listen. Did they always listen very well? Not very well. But you have to learn to listen. When Jesus was fixing to leave, what did he say to them? I'm going away, but I'm sending you another. Who was he sending? Who did Jesus send? Wow. As us, we need to learn to listen to who? Holy Spirit, all right? He's going to be our teacher, our guide, our director. He's going to show us what to say, not to say. He can bring things to our remembrance. Isn't that cool to have something like that in you? My wife does a pretty good job of helping me in that kind of things. But the Holy Spirit is with me all the time. So I have to learn to be a good listener, right? I have to learn to submit. Those guys had to change their whole lifestyle and start doing something different. And submission is a very important part of fellowship. Think about this. In the marriage, when God says to the husband and wife, you're going to have a child, right? What does God say about marriage? Husbands and wife are to do what? Submit themselves what? One to another. Listen, if only one of you is listening and only one of you is submitting, it's not going to work so well. Ladies, that was a good time to say amen. Okay. It takes a lot of sacrifice to be a follower. It takes the ability to, to fail and get up and move again. Did you know Jesus set his disciples up many times to fail, to teach them a lesson? You see, those are principles that Jesus put in there. How about this? Leaders are great planners. Interesting. Chuck has been preaching about Luke. And he preached about one of the miracles. You remember the miracle of when he fed the 5,000? How many remember that? Now, leaders are great planners. Do you know there was only one person mentioned out of the whole group that planned for that meeting? Who was it? The kid. The kid said, hmm, this may be long. I'm bringing food. Not one parent thought of that. At least that's recorded. And that's why leadership should be seen in our kids. We've got kids in this church that have the potential to be dynamic leaders in the church. And we ought to be pouring time about showing them the leadership. You know where the great, the best youth ministers come from? The students that feel that movement upon them and become the leaders. Amen? So these are some great, great principles there, and we could study each one of them in a mighty way. So I want you to go to the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 4, be turning there, and then go over to Philippians chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and Philippians chapter 4. First Timothy chapter 4, First Timothy. In Philippians, and I want you to see something. What I want to speak on this morning is one of the most important, probably the most important leadership skill that you can have. And it'll make a difference whether you're in business, or you're in some kind of organization. It is the, probably the most important thing that you can have. It is the one that will be more influential. It'll be one that will cause more impact. And it's probably the most difficult because you can't turn it off. And that's the skill of being the example. Of being the example. Paul said to Timothy, chapter 4, verse 12, let no man despise your youth. There you go. You see somebody that's younger in a leadership role. But be thou, or be you the example of believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, and purity. We could just park right there and go over every one of those words if we wanted to. He told Pimpty, you've got to be the believers. Now, 
We as leaders need to understand we need to be the example. And I say every Christian is a leader. Why do I say that? Because you have the potential of leading somebody else to Jesus. That puts you in a leadership role. You have the potential to affect somebody's life by your testimony. That puts you in a leadership role. So we as leaders need to understand that we should be the example of the believers. Now go over to Philippians. Chapter 4, verse 9. And listen to what Paul says. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in Jesus? He didn't say that, did he? How much reading that? What did he say? We received and seen in who? God. In me. Paul said, what you've seen in me, do. How many would say that? Put your name there. Chuck, what you've seen in me, what you've heard of me, what I've been doing, I want you to do the exact same thing. Most people are not going to put themselves out there. Because that requires a responsibility. That requires discipline. That requires a lot of stuff that's got to go on in your life. But that is exactly what God wants us to do. Paul said this. And the God of peace shall be with you. Wow. Wow. If you follow me, what I do, what you hear, what you've learned, what you've received from me, the God of peace is going to be on you. That's a pretty bold statement. How many want to stick their necks out and say that? But it's exactly where Christians should be at. We are the example. It is a responsibility that God wants us to be in. To be the leaders. What does it mean to be the example? That's the big question. What is it to be the example? Well, first of all, I'm going to give you about four things here, five things that's going to be the example. We may not do all of them, but we're going to get some of them. The first one is this. The leader sets the tone. There was three women. They were sitting around talking. And... And the conversation got about their kids. One lady says, you know, my son is a priest. And when people come into the room, or when he walks into the room, they say, Father. The other one says, you know, my son is a pastor. When he walks in the room, they go, Reverend. The other lady, not to be outdone, said, well, you know, my, my son is a, is a bishop. He walks in the room, they go, your holiness. So they look over to the fourth lady, and she's just kind of sitting there, and they say, well, what about your son? She goes, my son wears a size 20 shoe. He is seven foot one, weighs 410 pounds, and when he walks in the room, they all go, oh my God. <laughs> you see, the, the tone of a leader is there. When John the Baptist was baptizing, one day Jesus walked up and he turned around. The scripture said he had not met him yet. But he turned and said, behold, the Lamb of God. There is something about when a person recognizes that there's leadership in them, that God has called them to be a leader, that, that just seems to move when they move. I think about Worthy. Worthy, you were a colonel, is that right? Yeah. Bird colonel? Okay. Take the memory medicine, come on, okay? <laughs> he was a colonel. Now think about Worthy walking in, that baritone voice. What are you, six foot six, seven? Six five. Six five, okay. Six five, that baritone voice. And when he walked on my, in the room, I bet they said, oh my God, it's the colonel. Right? 
There was something about him that, that showed he was the leader walking in. We had a situation where the, the, the drivers had to take all the kids off the bus because two other students were, let's say, were not too friendly toward each other. And they were trying to set the kids aside. I went to the scene and kids were everywhere. These were high schoolers and things. And they were starting to move off. And as I got up and they started walking, they looked and they all went Whoo! And the voices, the things they were saying just went Whoo! And I thought, how did that happen? I never said a word, I never said anything. There's something about leadership that sets the tone of what's going to be around them. Now, here's the next one. This one is the one we may park at for a while. Not only do they set the tone, but leaders set the standards. Can you imagine today if there was no standards for a school bus driver? Do you know when I started in the business that the standard was if you wanted to be a school bus driver, you came to the transportation, you got an application, somebody got in a bus with you, took you down to the DPS, and you drove the bus for them. And if you were able to drive the bus, you passed, you were a bus driver. Through the years, a lot of major accidents, people being killed, they began to realize there needed to be better standards for it. Nowadays, the moment you walked in, you get a driver's license check. You can see a lot of stuff on driver's license. Then you have to go get drug tested. Then you be fingerprinted. Then you go through a background check about where you worked at. Then you have to come and do five written tests. Then you have to do a test at DPS where you do the inspection of the bus, do an air brake test. Then you have to do a skills test. You have to parallel park a school bus. Some folks can't do that in a Volkswagen. And then they'll let you drive it on the road to see how good it is on the road. There are standards set. In the scriptures, a standard was something was set also. Numbers chapter 2 verse 2 says, Every man of the children of Israel shall pitch his own by his standards. What that meant was, in Moses' day, they built the tabernacle. And around the tabernacle, there were 12 tribes of Israel. And each tribe was posted at a certain place. And if you were in, say, the tribe of Dan, you were in a certain location. And in front of your tent, you put a pole and it had a flag on it that says, that represented the tribe of Dan. But not only did that represent the tribe of Dan, it represented you were the nation of Israel of God Jehovah. It was something very important. It was such an impact that when Rahab was working with the spies that came in, Rahab stood before them and said, we've seen these Israelites. We've seen what God has done with you. We know who you are. It stood out as something wonderful. Why? Because they had the standards of God and people recognized that. You see, folks, we need to understand that we have standards too. Think about this when Joshua, at the end of his life, he brought everybody in together. He said, listen, you have a choice to make. I'm ad-libbing a little bit. You have a choice to make this day. Today, you can go back and do what your fathers did before we came across the sea. How they worshipped all these other things. You can even worship the people that we have, their gods, if you want to. But I'm telling you the standards I'm setting up for me. As for me and my house, what? We're going to serve the Lord. He was setting the standard for the Israelites, what they were going to do in the promised land. Those folks stood up and said, we choose to serve or to take hold of the standards that God has sent before us. Ah, oh, listen, as they moved along, Joshua died. But it says the elders continued to set the same standards as Joshua put out as the Israelites were living there. But then something happened. It says the Israelites began to go back and worship Baal. 
He's been just talking all the different practices. Now, what is the worship of Baal? Idol worship. They were doing things, idol worship. They were doing sacrifices. Even some could be human sacrifices. All kinds of stuff like that. The scripture says they did evil unto God. They forsake. They quit listening to God. What happened? God says a generation rose up that knew not God. Leadership went away. Standards went away. And suddenly they were falling right back into where they used to be. Can you understand that? Now, you say that's Old Testament. Go to the New Testament. And I want you to get this. The New Testament. Jesus died for the what? Okay. But he also died for something else. He gave his life for the, the church. Did he not? He says the church is his what? His bride. Okay. Matthew. Okay. How you answer these questions <laughs> can determine how good you go home, okay? Right. All right. That's your lovely bride over there, your wife, right? Sure is. How long have you been married? Five years. Five years. Was it love at first sight? Nope. No? Good. <laughs> okay. Love on working on it, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But now it's, I mean, it's wonderful. Oh, yeah. It's great, right? Oh, yeah. So when you go home, you still have that, and you walk in and you see her. Yeah. Okay, good answer. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we're going to have Micah come over here just a second. And over here, you stand over here. All right. Okay. Micah, come over. So here's the love of his life, right? The one that took a period of time to develop, but again, <laughs> once it did, it worked. I mean, it's worked out wonderful, right? right? This is what, I mean, you come, you look forward to this, right? I mean, this is wonderful. Josh, come up here. <laughs> Look at this guy. I mean, he could be a model. Look, <laughs> muscles, perfect beard, still has hair. I mean, I mean, the guy's looking good. His eyes really Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, he looks pretty good, yeah, right? Okay, make sure. I mean, this is, I mean, a really good guy. Now, let's say this is the church. And let's say this is the world. Don't look him at as the man, but this is the world, right? This is the church, right? Who do you want to come home to look at? Okay. <laughs> there was a little delay there, you know? Okay. So get this. Jesus says he died for the church. It is his bride he's coming back for. He wants to see it un, what, ble without blemish, without spot, right? But in Revelations, what did Jesus do? First two chapters. First three chapters. He comes to the church and he begins telling them there's some things that are just not right. You see, this is the world. The world will always move away from the church. Okay? It'll always do this. But the tendency of humans is to follow the world. You get that? Jesus comes and says, I got some things against you. One of the churches said, do you know you're actually practicing some of the things of Baal? Let me go over here. What is Baal? It's, it's the seductiveness, the, the lustfulness, the Baal did all kinds of pornography and sexual uh, devious things. And the world looks like a beautiful, wonderful picture. He goes to another one and said, you're, you're following the Nickelodeons. Are that Nicholas, Nicholas? You know what I'm talking about. They were a group that said that were a part of the church, but they came back and said, no, we don't like this all. We're going to make our own. We'll make up our own ideas. What do we see in church today? We're straying away biblical principles. This is the church over here that started, the Bible says, 
that Jesus said, you're even letting that old Jezebel teach the classes and seduce people. And so what he's saying is, in this way, okay, in this way, the church is starting to look more like the world. And so when the Savior looks over here, he gets a vision of, hmm. Hmm. (laughs) When he wants to be, this. (laughs) Good job. Okay? That is what Jesus was talking about. Now listen to this. This is some old time preaching. And people may say it's not relevant for today. But Paul says this. Be not what? Conformed Conformed to the what? What does that mean? It means as a, a group, we need to stop trying to look like the world. We shouldn't let social media... Google or any fancy tell us what our styles or what we should live like and how we should talk. Don't be conformed to the world. How do we do that? Be you separate and come out from among them. Listen to what Peter said. What did Peter say? I know. Peter said this. You are a chosen what? Generation. You see, folks, you are called. That's a calling. When Jesus, when you came, Jesus came into your life, that didn't just happen. It happened because one day the Holy Spirit grabbed a hold of your heart and God, the Holy Spirit, began to call you into the, into the Savior's hands. You are called. He said, you are a chosen generation. When I went to Judson... And I started seeing all this stuff, and I got to thinking, Lord, which one of us made a mistake here? The word that came in speaking to my heart, he said, neither one of us, I called you to be here. And I know without a doubt, the reason I'm there is because God called me, and there's a mission for me to perform. There's things he still wants me to do because of that calling. You are a called generation, a what? Royal generation priesthood. Jesus' natural lineage came from who? David, who was the king. In the natural, he had royal blood, but he's also called what? The king of kings and the lord of lords. And we are joint heirs with Jesus. We are brothers and sisters. We we are sons and daughters of the Lord. And have joint heirship with him. We have royal blood in us. He says we're a holy generation. What does that mean? We have the Holy Spirit living in us. There's parts of us that is holy. Amen? Turn to somebody and say, yeah, you're holy. You're holy. You didn't say that very loud, but okay. You don't believe it. But we're holy. Then he said this. You are a peculiar people. Now that doesn't mean that we're supposed to wear our hair in a bun, pull it straight back, no makeup. That doesn't mean that. Doesn't mean you have to wear a beard with a black hat. He don't have a black hat, okay? You don't have to wear a black hat, black. It doesn't mean we have to say these and thous and or that we're so righteous that we can't sit down with somebody that's sin. What it means is that our standards are so different than the world is that we stick out like a sore thumb. And it's not an evil thing. It's a thing that is our testimony to the world. Ooh, that's something right there. I'm afraid today in our society we're losing that. Those standards are beginning to slip away. And the church is becoming, looking more like the world than the world is something pardoned from us. Real quickly, leaders are the tone. Leaders demonstrate the uh, standards. 
leaders demonstrate what faith looks like. What faith looks like. I asked my wife this, what does faith look like? And she said, well, I don't. and I said, well, what does it look like? You see, God's word in Hebrews said, without faith, it's impossible to please God. If it's impossible to please God without faith, then, then shouldn't the church be really moved by what faith is all about? Yes. If God's word says it's impossible to please him without faith, Shouldn't that be one of the greatest things that we teach and what faith is all about? Faith is just th things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. What in the world does that mean? It means that faith is this. It is something that is there that you don't have no ability, no skills, no finances, no intellect to be able to do it. That is faith. It's something you could not do on your own that God is going to do through you. H-E-B calls it, this is where you're willing to take the chance. It's that person that says, I'm going to open my own business. Well, how are you going to do it? I don't know, but I'm going to do it. You see, on the world side, it looks like it's a chance. But on God's side, what's impossible to us is what? Possible to God. That's what faith is. I'm going to throw this out there. This is just something to think about. A year and a half ago, we started talking about possibility of building another building. A, 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 a what? Gymnatorium, multi-purpose building, etc. And good favor. People came back. Hey, yeah, that's a great idea. Wonderful. Then COVID hit. We kind of pushed it aside. Let me go back three months ago. God always prepares us for where he wants us to go. Three months ago, we recognized we had a, our building was falling down on this side. We had all the plans, fix this up, do all this, talking about the building. That had to be a priority. We weren't sure what the cost was going to be, but by faith, we said, we're going to fix this first so we can do this. Am I right? 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 So we took the step, we're going to do this. Out of nowhere, somebody walked in and said, oh, by the way, I'll do it for free. You see that little caviar God sticks out there? Right? So here we are thinking about a new building. We look at, started getting inquiries about, oh, the prices double and triple in cost. Can't get materials. People are not doing this and doing that. Hard to get workers. It sounds like a good recipe for faith to me. Am I right? I can't do it. Don't have the means to do it. It's overwhelming. It's beyond my control. I can't do it. Does that not sound like faith? Think about this. The church leadership should demonstrate faith so that when the congregation, individuals, find themselves in a situation, they can say, oh, I know what faith looks like. Wouldn't that be something if we said, we're going to build that building, we're going to do it, and in a year and a half it's out there, and people said, how'd you do it? Well, let me tell you how we did it. God just began bringing people in. Somebody began writing checks, and it just came to be because there's nothing impossible with God. And God loves us to live in faith. Then you go, oh, that's what it's about. You don't have to come to me and ask me to pray for you. You pray to the Father. You're saying, for Father, you did it for them. You can do it for me. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen. That should have been good, folks. Because some of you folks may be going through something right now that you need to know what faith looks like. And that's what leadership does. Always brings that. Real quickly, next one. Leaders provide vision. Now people get all messed up when you start talking about vision. But here's what vision is. Where are we going? How are we going to get there? We have people in the church to talk about financial planning. Where are you going? How are you going to get there? Mike over here can tell you where he's going in three years. 
Two days, 10 hours, 15 minutes. He's moving to where? To a little cabin up there. He's got it planned out. He knows where he's going. He's got a plan how to get there. Leaders do that. Where are we going? How are we going to get there? Lastly, leaders take the opportunity or disappointments as opportunities for victory. I don't care where you're going or what you're going to do. There's always going to be disappointments. There's always going to be detours. There's only going to, always going to be dead ends. But a leader looks at it that this is the greatest opportunity for victory. Paul said, we are more than overcomers. What is an overcomer? He's the person that gets in the battle and comes on the other side as the victor. Listen, that's what a leader does. And everyone in this room has leadership abilities. And you can be that example. H-E-B says this, and I think you see it in the scripture. Leaders are the driving force for success. The driving force for success. Look in the scriptures. Nehemiah saw the walls falling down. The people couldn't worship because they were being killed trying to get there. Just the cupbearer, he could visualize those walls. He took the stand before the king. I need to go and build the walls. And the king said, you can go. Oh, by the way, king, I need lumber. I'm going to need you to haul the lumber there. I need you to bring your soldiers to protect me. I need your signature. I need all these other things, king, because we got to do this. That's what leaders do. They're the driving force. So in closing this morning, what's the challenge today? I would say the challenge is this. Number one, that our elders here, pastor, take more aggressive understanding of what leadership is and develop more leadership opportunities of training in the church. We've got some great leaders here in this church. We just got to show them the principles through God's word. I would say that there are great opportunities today to begin to move, help our young people, get them involved, let them be a part of leadership things. I remember as a kid, we had have a youth Sunday. The youth had to lead the music. The youth had to preach. I didn't know what in the world I was going to preach on, but I did it one time. But it's amazing. You put them in a position to take charge in some way or another. I think that our, everyone in this room needs to recognize who you are in God. A chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy generation, a peculiar people, because you stand for the standards of God. With our heads bowed right now, May this be a challenge for the new year, where you are in your life, and where we are as a church, what the potential of what we can do. Father, in the name of Jesus, right now, may you take this word. May it be a word that, as you say, you'll, you, you'll make it do what you want it to do. Maybe it's a seed today. Maybe today it's a seed that's already been there in somebody's life, but it's the watering for it to begin to bloom and break out of the ground. May it be something that will challenge a church as a body to go beyond what we do every day, to do what we've never done before. Maybe a challenge to the deacons and to the, the elders and, and that we can see beyond today, that we can see where we need to go for this year, next year, and five years down the road, and what we could do, not to just build for us, but build for the generation that's coming up. May this be the day, the Lord, our standards become the standards that when people look at us, they will see Christ. 
They will see the bride that Jesus is looking at. In Jesus' name I pray.